Welcome to Gethsemane Episcopal Church, especially welcome to those of you who are uh, visiting today and welcome to you on the live stream as well. Um, I did need to let you know that the CDC has placed Grant County once again in the level high, which is a level uh, reflecting um, deaths in the county from COVID and also hospitalizations. The vestry has asked that when we are in high that we mask I know that as you were coming in, we had run out of masks. So the um, ushers, if they have found them, okay, they found some, they're gonna come around. And if you could just indicate that you want one, then they will help you out with that. All right, that's all for now. So let's take a breath together, center ourselves and prepare to continue to worship. Blessed be God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit and blessed be God's kingdom, now and forever. Amen. Almighty God, to you all hearts are open, all desires known, and from you no secrets are hid. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name through Christ our Lord. Amen. <laughs> Let us pray. Almighty God, 
you have given your only son to be for us a sacrifice for sin and also an example of godly life. Give us grace to receive thankfully the fruits of his redeeming work and to follow daily in the blessed steps of his most holy life. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Hold on, I'm caught up. <laughs> Our first reading is a reading from the book of Isaiah. Let me sing for my beloved my love song concerning his vineyard. My beloved had a vineyard on a very fertile hill. He dug it and cleared it of stones and planted it with choice vines. He built a watchtower in the midst of it and hewed out a vine, a wine vat in it. He expected it to yield grapes, but it yielded wild grapes. And now, inhabitants of Jerusalem and people of Judah, judge between me and my vineyard. What more was there to do for my vineyard that I have, that I have not done it in it? When I expected it to yield grapes, why did it yield wild grapes? And now I will tell you what I will do to my vineyard. I will remove its hedge, and it shall be devoured. I will break down its wall, and it shall be trampled down. I will make it a waste, it shall not be pruned or hoed, and it shall be overgrown with briars and thorns. I will also command the clouds that they rain no rain upon it. For the vineyard of the Lord of hosts is the house of Israel, and the house and the people of Judah are his pleasant planting. He expected justice, but saw bloodshed, righteous, but he heard a cry. The word of the Lord. We will read responsively Psalm 80, verses 1 through 2 and 8 through 18. Hear, O shepherd of Israel, leading Joseph like a flock. In the presence of Ephraim, Benjamin, and Manasseh, you have brought a vine out of Egypt. You prepared the ground for it. The mountains were covered by its shadow. You stretched out its tendrils to the sea. Why have you broken down its wall? The wild boar of the forest has ravaged it. Turn now, O God of hosts, look down from heaven, behold, and tend this vine. They burn it with fire like rubbish. Let your hand be upon the man of your right hand. And so will we never turn away from you. Restore us, O Lord God of hosts. Our second reading is from the book of Hebrews. By faith, the people passed through the Red Sea as if it were dry land. But when the, Egypt, but when the Egyptians attempted to do so, they were drowned. By faith, the walls of Jericho fell after they had been encircled for seven days. By faith, Rahab had prospered. Rahab the prostitute did not perish with those who were disobedient because she had received the spies in peace. And what more should I say? For time would fail me to tell of Gideon, Barak, Samson, Jephthah, and of David and Samuel of the prophets, who through faith conquered kingdoms, administered justice, obtained promises, shut the mouths of lions, 
quenched raging fire, escaped the edge of the sword, won strength out of weakness, became mighty in war, put foreign armies to flight. Women received their dead by resurrection. Others were tortured, refused to accept release in order to obtain a better resurrection. Others suffered mocking and flogging and even chains and imprisonment. They were stoned to death. They were sawn in two. They were killed by the sword. They went out in skins of sheep and goats, destitute, persecuted, tormented, of whom the world was not worthy. They wandered in deserts and mountains and in caves and holes in the ground. Yet all these, though they were commended for their faith, did not receive what was promised, since God had provided something better so that they would not, apart from us, be made perfect. Therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witness, let us also lay aside every weight and the sin that clings so closely, and let us run with perseverance the race that is set before us. Looking to Jesus as pioneer and perfecter of our faith, who for the sake of the joy that was set before him endured the cross, disregarding its shame, and has taken his seat at the right hand of the throne of God. The word of the Lord. Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to Luke. Glory to you, Lord Christ. Jesus said, I came to bring fire to the earth, and how I wish it were already kindled. I have a baptism with which to be baptized, and what stress I am under until it is completed. Do you think that I have come to bring peace to the earth? No, I tell you, but rather division. From now on, five in one household will be divided, three against two and two against three. They will be divided father against son and son against father, mother against daughter and daughter against mother, mother-in-law against her daughter-in-law and daughter-in-law against mother-in-law. He also said to the crowds, when you see a cloud rising in the west, you immediately say, it is going to rain. And so it happens. And when you see the south wind blowing, you say, there will be scorching heat, and it happens. You hypocrites, you know how to interpret the appearance of earth and sky, but why do you not know how to interpret the present time? The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Christ. In the name of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. It's a little funny to me when we have readings like that and we still have all of our fanfare and we say, praise to you, Lord Christ. <laughs> That's really also that Hebrews reading. Wow. What is going on there? But we don't have time for all four passages. So we will proceed today with our gospel reading. 
I had a boss once who was in his mid to late 40s. I was about 22 and therefore thought he was beyond ancient, right? Uh, that's funny to me now, of course. I remember he used to talk about someday when he and his wife, who was about the same age, were going to have kids. Someday. And I couldn't help but think, sir, do you know what time it is? Now, please do not think I am horrible. They were not undergoing fertility treatment. They were not desperately trying to start their family. They just hadn't gotten around to it. And he would mention it kind of frequently, and I just remember an inner raising of one eyebrow, kind of feeling like, yeah, someday when you have kids. Part of me wanted to say, now is the time, my friend, do not wait, right? And I, I just wasn't quite sure if he knew what time it was. This tends to be a younger person kind of problem. I don't know too many elderly people who don't know what time it is. Although, on the other hand, just a few years ago, my grandma was still talking about <laughs> little old ladies. And around the time she turned 90, one of us felt it necessary to say, Grandma, <laughs> the fact is, you are one of the little old ladies now. I'm sorry. And she just laughed. Do we know what time it is? I want to give us a, a more important example about telling time. This is a famous quote from the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King, a razor sharp critique that has never been more true than it is in our day. Dr. King said, and I am I'm quoting him, so Anyway, just keep that in mind. He said, I must confess that over the last few years, I have been gravely disappointed with the white moderate. I have almost reached the regrettable conclusion that the Negro's great stumbling block in the stride toward freedom is not the Ku Klux Klanner, but the white moderate who is more devoted to order than justice, who prefers a negative peace, which is the absence of tension, to a positive peace, which is the presence of justice, who constantly says, I agree with you in the goal you seek, but I can't agree with your methods of direct action, who paternalistically feels he can set the timetable for another man's freedom, who lives by the myth of time and who constantly advises the Negro to wait until a more convenient season. Dr. King understood what time it was, and too many of his white contemporaries did not. That one line struck me in particular this week when he said, a person who paternalistically feels he can set the timetable for another man's freedom. Preach Dr. King. Yes, Dr. King knew what time it was. Jesus knew what time it was too. And you may be a little startled by Jesus today in our gospel lesson, by his tone, by the words he said. For starters, what's all this fire talk, Jesus? Because for those of us who were raised in kind of a hellfire and brimstone sort of tradition, we begin to feel just a little bit antsy when someone gets really worked up about fire. Also this, Jesus, what are you talking about? You most certainly did come to bring peace on the earth. So what's all this nonsense about division? The very idea, Jesus breaking up homes and dividing loved ones from one another? Someone should really have intervened when he started blathering about all of that. Someone really should have gone to fetch his mother, I think. His, maybe she could have talked some sense into him. She may have had a few choice words for him about like dividing families up and whatever. Peace is good generally, right? And division, typically bad. And also, Jesus, how dare you talk about dividing mothers and daughters and mothers-in-law and daughters-in-law because we women need to stick together. I will say though, on the other hand, Jesus' mother did have a few choice words earlier in Luke's story. 
that actually resonate pretty well with some of today's teaching. In Mary's Magnificat, what we call the Song of Mary in chapter one, which I believe is the interpretive key for understanding the Gospel of Luke, she lays down some boundaries that in the short term might very well cause some division. Mary magnifies God as the one who lifts up the lowly and humbles the proud, who feeds the hungry and sends the rich away, empty. Mary throws down the gauntlet and people kind of fall to one side or the other when God is bringing about this kind of kingdom. I think there's some people who just wouldn't like it there very well. Incidentally, this is the mood Jesus is in in this passage. It's a kingdom of God kind of mood. This is the fire he's talking about. Not so much judgment in a certain way, like punitive, retributive, not so much that as a refining, consuming fire that burns away all corruption, a fire that purifies. This is the mission that he's straining ahead towards. This is the future that calls to him and which he is leaning into. This, this kingdom of God thing, this is what he is so stressed about. And also, did you notice the use of that word? <laughs> stressed. I had to laugh the first time I noticed it this week. Jesus, are you stressed out? I don't know whether to be relieved that I'm in really good company or to be even more anxious that even Jesus himself is stressed out. But the stress that he describes, it's like the stress of labor, of childbirth. It's focused. It will bear life. It is not the scattered, anxious, exhausted, hamster wheel that we are talking about when we say that we are stressed. No. When you know what time it is, like Jesus, like Dr. King, then everything gets quieter, simpler in some ways, and very focused. When you know what time it is, silly things kind of drift to the periphery. Unworthy opponents fade to the background. I don't have time for this nonsense, we say. When you know what time it is, the things that would drain the mental and emotional energy right out of you are revealed as puffs of smoke. They're nothing to worry about. Do we know what time it is? It's time for the Song of Mary. It's time that the Putins of the world fall, that those who would plunder the earth and her people for selfish gain would come to ruin. Because if they don't, if there isn't a shift in this generation, then time may just run out for human life on earth. And I don't mean in a thousand years, I mean, I am stressed out about my grandchildren. If we know what time it is, then we know that the hour is very, very late for the earth. Speaking of stress, we don't really like to say that out loud much or look it directly in the eye because number one, we're already so stressed out about everything else, about our own, you know, small worlds. And number two, what can we even do about it, right, for practical? Number three, it's just too big. The climate crisis seems too big to even think about. But if we know what time it is, then we must. We must think about it and we must act. I actually believe that doing so, that taking some action, can help bring a level of focus to our lives that really could bear some fruit. It is not all on us. I am not suggesting that. 
and we cannot save the earth, not by ourselves. So just let that one go, right? You do not bear the weight of the whole world, but we can do a few things. The first thing I propose is that we can stop treating our own bodies and our own lives in the way that humanity treats the earth. Something that it's okay to burn up, to overtax, to shackle to a wheel of constant productivity. I believe the microcosm mirrors the macrocosm and that if we shift one, maybe we could shift the other. Maybe I should just stop there because that proposal is so incredibly radical that it may take a few years for it to even sink in. But to repeat, the first action I am recommending is that we stop treating our own bodies and our own lives in the way that humanity treats the earth, something it's okay to burn up, to overtax, and to shackle to a wheel of constant productivity. What could that mean? What kind of life can we imagine for ourselves? What kind of freedom? The second thing I propose, if we really know what time it is, is local action. Like, and I mean like your own kitchen, like really, really local, really small action. Can we separate out what is compostable from our trash can? Can we wash and separate out that which is recyclable? Can we reduce our use of all plastics and waste? I read a wonderful and inspiring article this week about an island off the coast of Greece that is doing an amazing job working towards becoming zero waste. They actually do not have landfills anymore on this small island. The article pointed out, and these are quotes, that number one, and I don't always think about this, you know, I just feel like, well, yeah, I put recycling in the bin, I have no idea what happens to it next. But uh, bigger picture, the article pointed out that recycling can lower planet warming emissions by reducing the need to manufacture new products with raw materials whose extraction is carbon heavy. In other words, it matters. If we're doing it right, recycling matters. Number two, getting rid of landfills can also slow the release of methane, which is a really potent greenhouse gas produced when organic materials are buried in landfills instead of being composted. And number three, the article said, zero waste schemes in communities can generate more jobs than landfill disposal or incineration since collecting, sorting, and recycling trash is more labor intensive. So like all around, these are really great ideas and they create jobs and they help with the climate crisis. So if we know what time it is, can we take action as local as our own kitchens? And these are just ideas. You do not have to do them and there will be no follow-up, but they're really practical. They're good ideas. What about local as in our own towns? A small town can be the very best place to practice sustainability and to work towards what's called a circular economy. The climate disaster we face that is such a failure of politics and political will and individual cynicism is most of all a failure of imagination. We have to be able to imagine the world we want to evoke. Jesus is ready to kindle the fire in today's lesson. He is all geared up for action. He is focused because he knows what time it is. May we, as our opening prayer instructed us earlier, may we follow daily in the blessed steps of Jesus' most holy life. In the name of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. We continue now with the Nicene Creed. As we say together, 
We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven, was incarnate of the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and became truly human. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and from the Son, who with the Father and the Son is worshiped and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. As Paul comes to lead us in our prayers of the people, I just wanted to note that we have lit three candles today um, at our, our prayer votive candle altar um, in memory of, uh, well, and representing three particular situations that have affected people within our congregation. One was an episode of really terrible violence and murder. The next was um, the death of a child in a house fire. Um, and keeping that family very close to us right now that happened in Marion. And then the third is on behalf of David Riggs, who is the Dean of the Honors College at Indiana Wesleyan, who died um, from COVID this week, very young age, early 50s, and just the way that those have ripple effects amongst us. We're holding all of you close today who are uh, mourning those losses. If you would like to uh, light a votive candle. We don't talk about that a lot, but you're very welcome to do that. You can do it before church, during prayer time, during communion time, after church. It just represents the ongoing nature of our prayers that are always before God. Father, we pray for your holy Catholic Church Grant that every member of the church may truly and humbly serve you. We pray for all bishops, priests, and deacons. We pray for all who govern and hold authority in the nations of the world. Give us grace to do your will in all that we undertake. Have compassion on those who suffer from any grief or trouble. Give to the departed eternal rest. We praise you for your saints who have entered into joy. Let us pray for our own needs and those of others. We remember all who have asked for our prayers and we give thanks for those celebrating birthdays, um, including Tim Esch, Emma Horn, Dr. Susan Rogers, Ann Edwards and anniversaries, uh, especially Albert and Reverend Peg Har Harker. Please uh, refer to your insert for those ongoing prayers, short and long-term, and please add your own petitions and thanksgivings 
at this time, both silent and spoken. O oh Lord, our God, accept the fervent prayers of your people. In the multitude of your mercies, look with compassion upon us and all who turn to you for help. For you are gracious, O oh lover of souls, and to you we give glory, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, now and forever. Let us confess our sins against God and our neighbor. Praying together. Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry and we humbly repent. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your name. Amen. Almighty God, have mercy on you, forgive you all your sins through our Lord Jesus Christ, strengthen you in all goodness, and by the power of the Holy Spirit, keep you in eternal life. Amen. The peace of the Lord be always with you. Now greet one another in the name of the Lord. Peace to you on the live stream as well. Peace to you all. All right, if you want to be seated for just a moment, and then I don't want to forget to pray for birthdays and anniversaries. The beautiful flowers today are given in honor of Reverend Peg and Al Harker's anniversary. We're giving thanks for that and celebrating with you all. Um, speaking of altar flowers, if you would like to sign up to um, provide for the altar flowers, uh, just talk to Randy and Carol Powers when they return from their wonderful vacation that they are on right now. It's $20 um, to provide for the flowers, and you can give them in any way you want. You can give them anonymously. You can give them on behalf of a memorial or a celebration. So it's, it's a lovely practice, and I encourage it. Um, a few announcements, actually tons of them, but I will be just saying a few as we go. There were a lot of announcements in your weekly e-newsletter that came out Thursday, and if you don't receive that, please let Janie Slagle know. Janie is doing a wonderful ministry right now of updating our church directory, and she can also get me the info to add you to the e-newsletter list. So uh, first announcement, there's something called Taste of Marion that Indiana Wesleyan um, hosts in the fall each year, and it's like in a gym and Local places have booths set up and swag to give out sometimes, and we don't have a ton of swag. But we typically participate just to kind of, you know, raise awareness about Gethsemane and give a, a visual for folks there at IWU. This year, I am not able to, um, to do that booth. Mother Kirsten is willing to be the point person for that booth, but because of her work schedule, she can't be there the whole time. Also, we don't want her to do it alone. So if you are able and willing to help work the Gethsemane booth at Taste of Marion, please let me know right after this service. They gave us an extension to register, but actually we were supposed to already register. So tell me today, if possible, if you can help with that. It's, it's just like Manning, for lack of a better word, manning a booth, being friendly, talking to people, that's all it is. Oh, thank you, Stephanie. Yes, the date is Friday, September 2nd from 2 to 5. Um, and this came out in your e-news too. So if you get that, just reference that uh, email for the information. 2 to 5 on September 2nd. Okay, the Gethsemane Church Choir welcomes you. If you are a singer, if you love to sing, we would love to have you in the choir. Paul, do you want to say more about that? 
Yep. And the first date is August 21st. Is that one week from today? That is one week from today. So you just come early to church. You go to the parish hall for a little choir practice, and then you lead us in worship. It's a wonderful ministry, so please consider it. Um, is there a question? Okay, no. Uh, we have had some really good response about lawn mowing, so thank you if you contacted me about that. Um, and what else was I going to say? I think nothing. So I will get people's info posted to the volunteer sheet so you know when it's your turn. And if you've never done it before, see me today or, or schedule a time to meet with me like this week, and I can show you where the lawn mowing stuff is. If you have time to talk to me about it today, I will try to grab someone who knows more about it than I do. I can let you into the building, but I have never mowed a lawn. So I'm not like really an expert on that. Um, but yes, thank you for that response. Food Securities Ministry, I am going to follow up with the person who is doing a survey about that, and we would love to survey you very soon, that person is smiling at me right now, um, about your interest in maybe helping with food security ministries, either out in the community or at Gethsemane, but we are, we're working on that, and I want you to know about that. It's very wonderful and important. Um, yeah, that's all I'm going to say. We are looking for eight adults. We have shifted the conversation about children's ministry. We are doing it. The vestry is on board. We are pursuing children's Sunday school. We need eight adults um, who do not have to prepare curriculum, do not have to prepare in advance. We, we need eight adults <laughs> to serve on a rotation so that it's just every other month for 30 minutes downstairs with the kids. Separate from that, we're looking into the possibility of having something of a Sunday school director who could provide for the curriculum and the stability for the kids and this sort of thing. But separate from that, if you could serve on a rotation to sit downstairs for 30 minutes every other month, that is really what we need to launch, to relaunch our children's Sunday school. So please see me after church or contact me in some way if you are willing to sit downstairs for 30 minutes every other month so that we can relaunch Children's Sunday School. Thank you. Uh, church directory. Speaking of children's ministry, there is a Zoom training on September 24th, so I do that. want that on your radars. Anybody who sits downstairs for 30 minutes every other month needs to go through safeguarding training, which is something provided by the Episcopal Church via our diocese. Um, so September 24th, have that on your radar. That is all I'm going to say about the rest of these announcements. Does anyone else have any? Okay. Um, communion. You pretty much know this already, but if you need a gluten-free wafer, please let Mother Peg know. She'll be at the... the host station. Um, yeah. And please let the ushers dismiss you and please be masked as you come forward for communion. All right. Birthdays and anniversaries prayers. Did anybody have one that didn't get listed in the announcements? I'm sorry for the mistake last week. We had some repeats. We had some missing last week. We're back on track. Any birthdays this week? Okay. Then let's pray a special prayer of blessing. Oh, <gasps> Heidi has a birthday. There you are. That's so exciting. How old will you be, Heidi? 12. Congratulations. And I hope you have a wonderful celebration this week. Let's pray for Heidi. Watch over your child, O oh Lord, as her days increase. Bless and guide her wherever she may be. Strengthen her when she stands. Comfort her when discouraged or sorrowful. Raise her up if she falls. And in her heart, may your peace which passes understanding, abide all the days of her life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Happy birthday. All right, now let's pray a prayer of blessing for our beloved Harkers. O God, you have so consecrated the covenant of marriage that in it is represented the spiritual unity between Christ and his church. Send therefore your blessing upon these, your servants, that they may so love, honor, and cherish each other in faithfulness and patience, in wisdom and true godliness, that their home may be a haven of blessing and peace through Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Happy anniversary. 58. That is amazing. That is really amazing.
Thank you for your faithful example. Walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself an offering and sacrifice to God. is offered on behalf of all who are mourning and grieving this morning. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We 
Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right and a good and joyful thing, always and everywhere to give thanks to you, Father Almighty, Creator of heaven and earth, through Jesus Christ our Lord, who on the first day of the week overcame death and the grave, and by his glorious resurrection opened to us the way of everlasting life. Therefore we praise you, joining our voices with angels and archangels, and with all the company of heaven, who forever sing this hymn to proclaim the glory of your name. Gracious Father, in your infinite love, you made us for yourself. And when we had fallen into sin and become subject to evil and death, you in your mercy sent Jesus Christ, your only and eternal Son, to share our human nature, to live and die as one of us, to reconcile us to you, the God and Father of all. He stretched out his arms upon the cross and offered himself in obedience to your will, a perfect sacrifice for the whole world. On the night he was handed over to suffering and death, our Lord Jesus Christ took bread. And when he had given thanks to you, he broke it and gave it to his disciples and said, take, eat. This is my body, which is given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. After supper, he took the cup of wine, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them and said, Drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Whenever you drink it, do this for the remembrance of me. Therefore, we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ has died. Christ is risen, Christ will come again. We celebrate the memorial of our redemption, O Father, in this sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving. Recalling his death, resurrection, and ascension, we offer you these gifts. Sanctify them by your Holy Spirit to be for your people the body and blood of your Son, the holy food and drink of new and unending life in him. Sanctify us also that we may faithfully receive this holy sacrament and serve you in unity, constancy, and peace. And at the last day, bring us with all your saints into the joy of your eternal kingdom. All this we ask through your Son, Jesus Christ, by him and with him and in him, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all honor and glory is yours, Almighty Father, now and forever. And now, as our Savior Christ has taught us, we are bold to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. 
And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Alleluia. Christ, our Passover, is sacrificed for us. of God for the people of God. Take them in remembrance that Christ died for you and feed on him in your hearts by faith with thanksgiving.
Well, that was a happy problem. This is the largest attendance we have had since before the COVID pandemic. Let us stand and let us pray together. Eternal God, Heavenly Father, you have graciously accepted us as living members of your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ. And you have fed us with spiritual food in the sacrament of his body and blood. Send us now into the world in peace and grant us strength and courage to love and serve you with gladness and singleness of heart through Christ our Lord. Amen. And now may the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be upon you and remain with you always. serve the Lord. Thanks be to God.